Hello, I am Dr. Rashid Ahmed from the Department of Physics of Kohat University of Science and Technology. In the subject of particle physics with the course code PHY452, we are at the lecture number 9 and the topic is strange particles. As the title suggests, we will talk about peculiar properties of some particles. If we go back into the history, into the year 1947, we will find that although there were few particles discovered at that time, but these particles were not only enough to explain the structure of the matter, but also the two known forces at that time, namely uh, electromagnetic interaction and strong nuclear interaction were explained by these particles. So let's first go into the year 1947 and see which particles were there at known at that time. The first particle which is known to us is actually uh, electron in the modern era of the particle physics. And then we had a proton and a neutron. These three particles actually constitute an atom and are responsible for the uh, structure of the atom. And then we had a slightly different particle called photon. This photon is actually a mediator of the electromagnetic interaction. That is, uh, when two charged particles exert force on each other, they actually exchange this photon uh, for the Coulomb interaction. And then the two new uh, uh, particles, two new mediators, these are the mediators of actually strong force. At that time, it, it was called uh, Yakawa force uh, because Yakawa thought that inside the nucleus, when we have uh, two protons and two neutrons there and they exert force on each other, actually they exchange uh, muons and pions. Uh, these are called mesons. Later on, it was known that pion is actually the uh, mediator of the strong uh, force and uh, and uh, not muon but these are the two mesons uh, which we call um, mesons because these are the middle weights and then one another particle we call a neutrino uh, which is uh, needed in the explanation of the beta decay uh, where the law of conservation of uh, energy is uh, restored if we uh, consider that a neutrino is there neutrino is slightly a mysterious particle but in 1947 it was well understood so these are the six particles known at that time and there were two theories, two big theories that one of them was quantum mechanics which was very much involved into the uh, particle physics and the second one was uh, Einstein's special theory of relativity and from the requirements of special theory of relativity uh, we knew that we have to have antiparticles that is every particle has its own antiparticle and if I list them you see here the electron has an antiparticle, we call it a positron and positron uh, is electron uh, similar to the electron in all respects only uh, uh, not in the charge where it has a positive charge. Similar is the case with the proton, it has antiproton but in case of the neutron because it is charged less there is no charge but there are other quantum numbers where antineutron is different from neutron. More interestingly, photon is actually its own antiparticle because there is no property which differentiates between photon and antiphoton and then we have uh, antiparticles to all, uh, all these known particles. This is another question that why at the moment we have more particles than antiparticles which is not still we don't know the answer to, uh, to this question uh, yet but at that time in 1947 we had only 14 fundamental particles to explain not only the structure of the atom but also the interactions known at that time. Mind you these particles were at that time considered fundamental but later on we found that some of them are not fundamental. For example, proton has a structure, neutron has a structure although electron and neutrino they are still considered to be fundamental particles. By fundamental we mean that they have no further structure. But these 14 particles make a uh, picture very simple. And this state of comfort actually did not last very long because we need f we had few particles that could explain the structure of the matter and the interactions. Very nice picture, very comfortable zone, very comfortable picture. But as you know in physics, uh, uh, we always have uh, a situation where we think that uh, everything is complete. We have a complete description for everything. But then uh, some discovery actually destroys this uh, state of comfort. And at that time, the uh, discovery which destroyed this uh, state of comfort was uh, a discovery of another particle called a neutral kaon. In the December of 1947, two scientists, R Russia and Butler, 
actually were doing experiments with a cloud chamber on cosmic rays. Here you see that the shower of cosmic rays coming down and they found out that uh, this V shape where they have uh, two pions that is a kaon going into the uh, two pions and these two pions uh, were, uh, were used to discover that there is another particle called kaon and this particle was put into the family of uh, mesons. If we go into the schematics, you, you can see uh, a better picture where you see that incident cosmic rays uh, shower coming down uh, from the heavens, from the skies and then it is uh, split into two uh, particles, this kaon, uh, pi plus and pi minus and these are actually the debris. And these two particles, uh, um, we already know about them, but we discovered a neutral kaon. Uh, why it was not welcomed? Because uh, you do not need it for the explanation of the structure of the atom. You do not need it into the uh, mediation of any force. So, it is it was actually not needed, but it is there. It was there. It was found. So, picture was disturbed and we have to found, find place for it, place for the neutral kaon, where to put it. But a story went on getting complicated by discovery of uh, um, other new particles. For example, with charge kaons and other similar particles. In 1947, Powell and, uh, and his colleagues discovered that there is actually another kaon which decays in, which is a charge kaon, uh, which decays into three uh, pions. So, we got list extended from 14 to 16, but uh, this was not end of the story and uh, we discovered even further mesons and the number was going up and up. Uh, um, uh, it came into hundreds of particles were discovered, hundreds of mesons were discovered and these are few of the names for example given to them, etos, uh, phi's, omegas and rows and so on and so on. But uh, things uh, were not that worse at that time, we have few mesons into the list and uh, scientists, physicists were trying to understand their properties and trying to put them into right places. And this story was even further uh, worsened by the discovery of another particle called lambda particle. This lambda particle was really a strange particle because uh, this particle decayed uh, well before that in 1950 Anderson discovered a lambda particle and it was it, it was it did not belong to the mesons family. It was very heavy and uh, that uh, belonged to the baryons family which is a, a baryon means a heavy particles. So, this lambda was decaying into the proton and into the pion. And now, uh, before going into further details of the lambda particle, um, I want to uh, throw a, a, a law here which is called a conservation of baryon number. So, we need to understand what is baryon number. Uh, so, in order to understand the baryon number, let us go into a slightly different uh, thing which is called a stability of proton. What do we mean by stability of proton? We know that the atom or ourselves, we are made out of atoms, are stable and uh, the nucleus of the atom is made of protons, which means proton is stable, proton does not decay into other particles. But if you look at this reaction, here this uh, proton actually is allowed to decay into positron into the gamma rays and this reaction has no problems, at least in 1947. Uh, all the uh, known laws of uh, conservation, for example, law of conservation of charge is not violated here, law of conservation of energy is not violated here, although the law of conservation of lepton number is violated here, but that was not known at that time. Now, there is a rule of thumb from the Richard Feynman who says that if something is not violated, if some process is not violated by any natural law, law of nature, then it is mandatory that it has to happen. Now, surely we do not allow this to happen, we, otherwise we will not exist ourselves. So, we need to discover a law which is violated here and people discovered the law of conservation of baryon number. So, in order to put this law into here, we first have to assign baryon number to every particle. So, let us assign uh, a positive one to the baryons and a negative one to the anti baryons and uh, to the rest of the particu uh, particles baryon number uh, 0. Now, this assignment is completely arbitrary, but well, this, uh, this, this actually helps. Uh, you can uh, say that baryons are minus ones and anti baryons are plus ones, but it does not matter. At the end, uh, baryon number uh, uh, is not conserved here. If you look at here in, in light of this new uh, conservation law and baryon numbers, you find out that uh, the proton has a baryon number 1, 
but here these two particles have baryon number 0. So, it means that baryon number is violated here and we cannot allow this to happen. So, this new uh, law of conservation of baryon number is discovered here and if you uh, use this law uh, and go to the neutron beta decay, you see that this uh, is allowed because here the uh, baryon number 1, 1 and this is 0 and 0. So, now the uh, this law, uh, this, this decay, this process is allowed uh, of because of the law of conservation of baryon number because it is not violated, but this the, uh, uh, the stability of proton is protected uh, because of the conservation of baryon number. And then we have uh, another process which is allowed that we have two protons interacting with each other and the baryon numbers one here, one here, one here, one here, one and minus one. So, since baryon number is conserved, so uh, we actually have the anti protons produced by from the interaction of two protons and this is a very usual process done everywhere for example, into the CERN, into the laboratories uh, people discover so many particles by colliding two protons. So, so far so good uh, we have discovered another uh, conservation law that is conservation of baryon numbers and we now we have now a new baryon other than proton and neutron a new baryon which is called a lambda particle and again this was not uh, restricted here and we got few or not few more other lambdas, uh, sigmas, lambdas, omegas and the list was extended into the hundreds of the particles. Actually, uh, it is uh, saying from uh, Willius Lamb in his uh, Nobel lecture that in the beginning uh, of the particle physics, uh, every new particle would win you uh, a Nobel Prize, but later on there were so many particles discovered that uh, now the discovery of uh, another new particle ought to be punished by a $10,000 fine because that was complicating the picture and, uh, uh, and uh, physicists at that time were really in trouble in order to characterize these particles, in order to put them into the real, uh, real places and understand their properties. But let us come back to this so many particles. Uh, so many mesons and baryons discovered at that time, so that uh, scientists were uh, were forced uh, to call them strange, strange particles. So the, all these heavy baryons were called strange particles. But this is not only reason that there are so many of them. There is another uh, technical reason to call them strange particles. And this technical reason is the first reason is that so many of them and this technical reason is that their production and decay mechanisms are completely different and how they are different. Actually these uh, heavy baryons are produced by the mechanism of strong force, but they decay by weak force and that is really strange that a, a particle is produced by one force, these are two completely forces, strong force and weak force, by produced by one force and decay by the another force. This does not happen for uh, uh, other usual known particles at that time. That is why uh, Gelman, which is known as the Mendeleev of uh, particle physics in Nishima, at that time gave the idea of strangeness uh, and they said that in 1953 Gelman and Nishima suggested a new property called strangeness and uh, strangeness is conserved in strong interactions, but not in weak interactions. That is why it is called strange and that time it looked very strange, although there are so many other things which are strange, but uh, Gelman um, had an idea to call uh, them uh, strange and they actually quantified this strangeness and uh, given it a quantum number which can measure the strangeness of a particle. So, uh, this, so, now we know that these uh, strange heavy baryons are actually strange because there were so many of them at that time and, uh, and also because they are not, uh, the strangeness is not conserved in strong interactions, uh, conserved in strong interactions but not conserved in weak interactions. So, the decay mechanism and the uh, production mechanism are completely different. Now, let us at the end of this lecture go into the uh, one concrete example of pion proton interaction and see that how uh, strangeness is conserved into the one uh, uh, decay into the production mode and not conserved into the decay mode. So, uh, if uh, we produce two strange particles for example, in this interaction you can see there are three possibilities that pion and protons uh, are actually collided and they can produce kaons. Uh, positive kion and negative kions plus some other uh, heavy uh, heavy baryons 
um, if you assign uh, uh, strainless uh, plus uh, one here and uh, minus one here and uh, zero there so you see that uh, this in production the strainless is conserved so zero here because these uh, pion and proton have zero in, uh, zero strainless although this uh, this assignment of strainless is completely arbitrary but if whatever uh, mechanism you choose uh, you will find out that strainless is completely conserved here so plus 1 minus 1 and 0 0 here so zero total zero here total zero on all three of them and you see that because of the uh, this conservation of strainless we never produced just a single particle for example these uh, uh, these processes are not allowed because strainless is zero here but here is minus one so this is not allowed and, uh, and so on in this case in this case uh, these uh, these strainless is not conserved in the production mechanism these uh, uh, these uh, strange particles are produced here uh, via the strong interaction where the we have to conserve the uh, strainless but when they decay for example here in this reaction you see this lambda particle this is a strange particle and this has a strangeness uh, as you can see minus one but when it decays it, it need not to conserve because the strainness on the right side in this reaction is zero but here it's minus one but we don't need to uh, have conserved for it. this this process this all these three processes are actually observed into the nature and the strainness is not conserved and these processes are also observed into the nature uh, in the laboratories as well and uh, they conserve the strainness so that's that's actually the strainness this is the strange thing about them that uh, the the strainness property is conserved into the um, into the production mechanism and production is going by the strong force and the decay is going by the weak force so two different forces for the same particle lambda produced here via the strong force lambda decays here via the weak force uh, so uh, I hope that you understood the idea of uh, strangeness. Uh, the main message uh, which you should carry from here is that uh, strangeness is a property of some heavy baryons where uh, in the production mechanism a strong force is involved and uh, strangeness is uh, needed to be conserved and we uh, found uh, some uh, examples, some uh, processes where strainness is conserved but when they decay uh, they decay through a weak force and strangeness is not conserved. Thank you very much.